call this meeting of the Eugene Planning Commission to order. First item on the agenda, as always, is public comment. Anybody in the audience care to address the Planning Commission? Seeing none, we'll move on to agenda item two, Envision Eugene Downtown Mixed Use Amendments Action. And I would just ask staff that uh, let's be cognizant of commission members as well of the time on this. We've got about a half hour to address it before we need to move on. So uh, who is covering for Alyssa? Christy? Uh, Christy's going to kick, kick it off for Okay, us. very good, Christy. <laughs> So we're here today to um, talk about further deliberations on a topic of uh, the uh, TIA um, traffic impact analysis, a, um, a requirement for downtown and the <coughs> removal of that and the level of service um, F requirement. And so um, we're here to just continue that conversation and then we will follow up with the conversation on the other items um, at a later meeting. So I don't know if you guys wanted to then um, start with your response to the specific questions that uh, was sure. posed. That would be great. So just to um, kind of rehash a bit, uh, last time we were here on the third, um, we were proposing the downtown area plan minus the eWeb master plan area as a TIA exempt and level of service F standard area. Uh, and the Planning Commission asked us to look at um, whether or not it may make sense to expand that area to the east, basically uh, encompassing part of the transit trans transit <laughs> transit over uh, development over oh well, my I'm messing up here <laughs> transit oriented uh, development overlay area Toto. Woo, thank you. <laughs> More uh, specifically, uh, the area around Sacred Heart <coughs> Medical Center's University District at East 13th and Hilliard. And we did do that. We looked at an area that was bounded by High Street to Alder Street and Franklin Boulevard to 13th Avenue that is not currently in the downtown plan area. There are some commonalities between that area and the downtown plan area, uh, interconnected grid of streets, you know, higher and lower order streets, um, good connectivity. Some things that are different and really are the basis for the recommendation we're going to uh, give you here is that um, the major hospital location, so Sacred Heart Medical Center University District, potential for future uh, traffic signal installations on 11th and 13th, and the predominantly residential nature of the uh, neighborhood, that's, that's between 11th and 13th and High and Patterson Street. Um, I got a chance to talk to Phil Farrington at Peace Health to get his opinion on the matter. If you remember, he did have some testimony regarding the TIA, but his testimony was um, more targeted towards the triggers that um, put you into a TIA, so looking at the net trips instead of just trips to trigger a TIA. When I spoke to him about the proposal to uh, extend the TIA exempt area and the level of service F area to Peace Health, he was not supportive of an, a level of service downgrade on Hilliard Street, which would need to be done in order to include all of Peace Health. Furthermore, he actually wasn't um, supportive of, of downgrading the level of service in the downtown area plan either, and that's I think, stems from some concerns about emergency um, services access to the hospital. So based on the conversation that I had with Mr. Farrington and our analysis of some of the infrastructure that wasn't built out in that area, uh, namely I think it comes to about three traffic signals on 11th and 13th that would feasibly be built out at some point, um, as well as trying to keep planning area boundaries as coterminous as possible, and I think trying to match a downtown area plan is, uh, meets that. We recommend staying with the, um, the current boundary, which is the downtown area plan minus the eWeb master plan area. Questions? We'd like to begin. Rick? Well, based on your conversation with Mr. Farrington and, and sort of what you just described, and I want, and I don't want to see a whole lot of different boundaries. Is there, is there a way to? Should we look at somehow um, including the West Thirteenth Avenue in the TIA requirement versus exempting it just because of? Hospital, can you give us a little more input on, on sort of what Mr. Farrington talked about and, and sort of the city's 
reaction to the idea of emergency traffic and so on down east and west 13th? Sure. Um, you know, well, a, a couple things come to mind. One is which, uh, as we previously discussed, none of the intersections within the downtown area are anywhere near level service F now. So we would be adjusting the standard to make it allowable, but that's not the context we're in now. I think everything is functioning at D or higher, most in the B and C category. Um, you know, part of the proposal of going to level service F downtown is that we're not going to be able to build out, and at some point we're going to get to a traffic level that will likely be a tipping point, but there's really not anything we're going to be able to do the transportation system to accommodate that and keep the level service up. So with that in mind, I don't know that there's um, functionally um, a change for the section of East 13th that is within the downtown area plan, whether we keep it at a level <coughs> of service E as it is allowable now or go to a level of service F. At, at the point at which we have that much traffic, you know, we're going to have a challenge with emergency service vehicles using the street one way or another. And then I guess just for clarity purposes, is level of service A through F sort of a, a linear change? For the most part it is. Okay. okay. It, doesn't, it doesn't increase exponentially. Uh, you look for anywhere from level of service A is typically and underneath 15 seconds. Level of service F is pretty much anything two minutes or over, and everything in between is generally in a linear fashion up to that point. Okay, thanks. So it's fairly intuitive. Yeah, I had the same concern because the main fire station that would be where the emergency vehicles would depart from uh, is the corner of Willamette and 13th. So, you know, you you obviously have to get out of that area um, to service an emergency, whether it was a fire or a uh, medical emergency, and obviously you want it to be as quickly as possible. So I was a little concerned about that section on 13th as well about loss of, you know, a reduction in the level of service given that that's the primary service center for emergency. Um, obviously, you need to get to the hospital as well, but you need to get something there to get something to the hospital. So I had a concern about that. And I was going to mention one other thing that we didn't discuss last time when I, when I was doing some research. I realized that um, usually the highest, highest air pollution levels are down on measured in the city of Eugene were basically down at the end of 13th and between Alder and Kincaid. Uh, you know, El Rapa had a state station set up there and they moved it on purpose because the levels, reading levels were so off the scale, it would have basically put Eugene into a different air pollution category if they used that as a standard. And that's because there's a lot of, there's a lot of slow traffic and there's already restrict, you know, people trying to back into spaces, you know, conflicts between um, bicyclists and pedestrians and cars, buses. So uh, I just wanted to mention that. that that would be another issue that I would have a concern about extending the uh, TIA boundary. So I mean, I'm fine with your decision to, to, to take that off the table. Although we are Eugene meets its air contaminant attainment goals. Only because we where we measure it. Well, we, we measure it at a different location. In other words, if we measured it at locations where it had the higher value, we would not be meeting our levels. We located the, the station at a place that has significantly lower values than this spot. So it's a question of where, you know, other jurisdictions <coughs> tend to measure it at the higher values. Other, you know, some jurisdictions want to measure it at the lower values. Well, I agree with the perception of the residential areas in between, and I think that's definitely a different character, and so I'm fine with not including that in the in that <coughs> boundary. And then the, the question that I had, too, and I think this came up last time, as far as emergency vehicles, uh, don't they still, do they all have uh, the ability to control the signals as they come through an area? And I know if there's traffic in the way, you know, that everybody's supposed to get off to the side and maybe it doesn't always happen, but at least as far as signal control, don't they, uh, they have that ability and I'm wondering, is, do you know if that's universal to all emergency vehicles or if that's just in specific areas? 
Well, the signals have uh, fire preemption. So, mm -hmm. yes, all of our signals are able to go green when an emergency vehicle is approaching it. So the level of service, what what that really may entail is that there's just there's more congestion to clear mm -hmm. the intersection. So more vehicles at the intersection if you're operating at a lower level of service. Okay. So even with the signal control, there may still be a slowdown because of the congestion, perhaps. It, it potentially, potentially it could take longer to clear. Okay. John, uh, <clears throat> I, I uh, concur in, in not including this in the original TIA exempt boundary. Uh, I do have a broader question, which I think I raised at the last meeting. If one looks at page five on your recommendations, you, you, Public Works indicates that uh, the TIA will remain the same, which I, I concur with, and uh, you know, with the exceptions of eWeb. Then you go, alternatively, the Planning Commission could explore changing the TIA by applicably triggers to account for traffic generation from prior uses. And you say, however, this option would raise new questions which weren't explored before the public hearing because it affects citywide. I don't understand why, why the recommendation couldn't be that with the statement that is within the downtown area, and that addresses the concern citywide. We've done that before in other areas where we've designated the spot. So I think the alternative is, is still on the table in my mind. Uh, additionally, if you look at your page three, in the last 12 years, there have only been two TIAs generated, which is Capstone and Northwest Community Credit Union. To exempt projects of that magnitude from a TIA in the future doesn't make any sense to me. And since there's not a lot of these that are being requested, I don't see the need for it. That's all. I've got a series of questions for you. Okay. Um, <coughs> You talk about Capstone and Northwest Community not requiring any mitigation as a result of their TIA. What type, can you give me some examples of mitigation that has resulted from TIAs anywhere in the city? What kinds of things do you impose? Sure. Can you answer uh, that? Um, I can answer that question. The last one we had, or we're, we're currently going through right now, was from Laurel Ridge, um, large large development um, off of 30th and Spring Boulevard. Um, large residential development produces a tremendous amount of traffic. One of the things that was discovered there was uh, farther down, I believe, at um, 30th and uh, 20th and Hilliard, is that there wasn't enough right turn capacity. So the, one of the additions they'd have to do was come in and add a right turn lane. Um, that was the, the most recent, recent upgrade we've had. There's also other circumstances where if you have a, a large development, um, I don't know of anything specific, I'm relatively new here, but fairly typical for a bit, you know, large commercial developments um, to take a look at signals, signalizing intersections to provide um, adequate access. Good pasture is a requirement to expand the bridge. That's correct. Good pasture was a relatively uh, unique situation. So there are, in the AIS, uh, it's listed other regulatory tools. There are four cited from the uh, DJ code. Absent the types of mitigation requirements that can be imposed from the results of a TIA, can those same sorts of mitigating conditions be imposed by these other four, as a result of these other four Eugene codes? Lane widening, lane widening bridge widening, signalization. I don't believe they could. Uh, reason being is that would require looking off-site and the tool the tool for us to get there is, is TIA. So okay. typical development, you'd be you'd be restricted to, fair, to pretty well your development boundary and the adjacent street network. Okay. The proposing that the TIA <coughs> be eliminated and the, L, and the level of service be dropped to F, are those connected or can we separate the two? Do you have to drop to F? Uh, because there's this comparison that's made in a TIA with the existing level of service and how it affects that. Do you have to impose LOSF in order to eliminate the TIA? Or can you, can you eliminate the TIA and still keep it at E? So the way that we are putting this forward is that you're basically lowering the level of service to F. Right. Thus, the TIA is, really doesn't have any impact. 
So, so the, the, the base of it would be lowering the level of service with the TIA exemption then coming as an effect. Right now, that. LOS dropping it to LOS F is what's driving this, not, not some TPR rule that says you don't have to do TIAs under certain cases. Okay. Oh. So back to the <laughs> question, can we, can we keep it at E and still eliminate or modify the TIA requirement? So the reason that we do not recommend doing that is that um, if you keep the lo level of service at an E and we get to the point that we're expecting down the line that you do end up having higher levels of congestion because we have a successful downtown and people are going to want to come to downtown and we can't widen streets and we can't really do <coughs> anything to get the level of service back up then that responsibility ends up with the city to try and figure out a way to bring the level of service back up to an E. Okay. And we, we don't recommend that we do that. If we're going to acknowledge that it's okay for downtown to have a higher level of congestion, it's a mark of a successful downtown, and that there really aren't any mitigation techniques that we can use to bring the level of service up, then we should lower the level of service to F. That takes me to the next point then. <laughs> In the a AIS, it said that level of service E was derived from the CAT study, the Central Area Transportation Study. So <clears throat> should there not be some kind of review of CATs to justify lowering this to F? I mean, I, I can maybe understand your explanation of that, but it just seems to kind of fall out of a process that we just by voting, raising our hands, we drop it to F when E was established from CATS. See what I'm saying? Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Catherine. How you doing? Okay, okay. Um, the interesting part about um, the level of service E in CATS is it's actually never, ever mentioned in CATS that I found. I went through it, and so you'll see what's actually getting amended is it's cited as the CATS boundary, level of service E. It states that in TransPlan, we have it um, in Chapter 9, but reading through all of CATS, never saw the statement that level of service E is established by CATS. So um, not being in the room when that was stated that the boundary for CATS is E, it may have been that that particular boundary was used, but it wasn't a specific decision that came out of CATS. Oh. But so I, I just, um, and if somebody else found it, please speak mm -hmm. out. I found it nowhere in there because we looked at it for this, this purpose. Um, and I wanted to say two other things um, about an earlier question you have, if I could. Your question about good pasture, the mitigation of the bridge was not based on TIA. It was based on zone change TPR. Oh, okay. Uh, um, okay. okay. So because you still have, for the TPR, you still have, you know, comp plan, uh, metro plan, zone changes. There's still very specific times when that's applicable. TIA, oftentimes you'll find it when there's a development that involves, um, th that can be straight up just, you know, outright permitted use. Before you leave that, mm -hmm. Catherine, was it as a result of the TIA that the, the loading capacity, that the volume on that is on the bridge, isn't that what, ha what would have identified the need to widen it even though it was a rezoning? Well, the TPR, and the, it's interesting, I mean, the term TIA is, you hear that people do TIAs for compliance with TPR. Yeah. We happen to use that term of art as a, as a separate requirement in our Chapter 9, but they did a, for purposes of demonstrating compliance with the TPR, Good Pasture did a traffic impact analysis that showed all of this. It's just a, it's just an unfortunate use of the same. Yeah, term. but I guess absent a TIA, how would we have known to impose a requirement on a zone change, TPR change? Right, but but the the TIA for the zone change purposes, for the zone change purposes, it had nothing to do with our code requirements for a TIA, okay. if that makes sense. So that's a standalone. But the TPR was the zone change and they had to demonstrate whether they were going to have a significant effect on any transportation facilities and 
the way developers do that to demonstrate whether there's going to be a significant effect is they do this analysis that is commonly called a traffic impact analysis. Okay. If and there's a zone change downtown, then that traffic analysis could still be required. Absolutely. TPR. Absolutely. Because of the function of the TPR. Yeah. There, I just recalled that there's some change was made to the TPR that I, I thought eliminated the requirements for TIAs. For zone changes, there there's a recent amendment to uh, the TPR that for if if there's a zone change consistent with the comprehensive plan, and a couple other requirements are also met, then it's a it's a presumed no significant effect. Right. And what that speaks to is the transportation system plan, our trans plan, wasn't based on zones. It was based on comp plan designations. Yeah. So if you have a comp plan designation at, um, that anticipates that type of zone, that range, why do it again? Right. Um, so that is new um, within the last year, and that was added. Is there a second question? That you um, just to touch on the level of service E, level of service F question that you that you asked, and you asked if it had anything to do with the TPR, and Matt, I think, covered it, but one of the things that if we were to just change, if we were just to uh, draw this boundary and say TIA, no TIA, because that's a code amendment, we have to demonstrate compliance with the TPR, which means we would, we need to demonstrate that it wouldn't that particular change wouldn't significantly affect any of the facilities within that boundary. Okay. And um, if there was going to be a significant effect, it had to be mitigated. One of those ways of mitigating it is dropping the level of service. So they do go hand in hand. Um, to a great degree, that analysis didn't need to be done because there, it was it was coming as a in tandem. So you had the mitigation already built into the overall approach, which also encompassed the policy decision of we're eliminating the TIA because we're comfortable, we're willing to be comfortable with um, the greater congestion. Okay, and that in in the discussion of this, saying that we haven't experienced level of service F downtown. I don't, I don't see that as a justification for saying, well, it's okay to go to F. If we're saying that we're going to write off downtown, and I don't mean that derogatorily, that there's just nothing we can do in terms of signalizations and widenings, then I can start to understand going to F based upon what you just said, Catherine. But the question, uh, the, the last question I have, I think Mr. Farrington's got some common sense here. Why not use net, the net increase and limit it, as Commissioner Jaworski is suggesting, just to this area for the time being? I mean, if a, if a new proposal generates in excess of 100 vehicles, but it's less than whatever the proposal is there now, why make them do it? Whereas, well, okay, if, if, if we're saying uh, level of service F, we don't have to worry about it at all, I guess. Okay, I'm, I'm tracking with you. But I still like this idea of net, the net impact. I think we ought to look at that on a citywide basis. Okay, who is it, Bill? Okay. Um, can you just describe I know Scott you were saying earlier that level of service F is maybe two minutes and a is 15 seconds what what is the actual difference between E and F is it um, a minute 45 to two minutes is it yeah. a minute and a half to two minutes do you I have to look it up don't quote me on it but okay. I believe it's 30 seconds is, is the difference between E and so it's the difference between maybe a minute and a half and, and two and minutes. Half, it's the minute and a half to two minutes is, is E I believe okay I believe F is above two minutes Okay. So it gives you that's, that's average delay text. Throughout, yeah. throughout all legs of the intersection. Okay. Rick? Uh, I'd like to thank staff um, for the extra information they gave us from our questions last week. I, I do have, and I support your recommendation that we don't extend this zone right now. Um, I, I do have a, a follow-up question. I don't think I saw it in, in here, but there was a question when we met before about if a TIA was to require mitigation or needed mitigation, and you just referred to the Laurel Hill property, 
which is the mitigation is quite a distance away. Is it reasonable to conclude, and I think I want this for to be on the record, is it reasonable to conclude that if a TIA said we needed to mitigate out of the exempt area, that we still really are working with grid streets and signaled areas and things like that, and there really wouldn't be much mitigation that might occur even outside the exempt area if there was a TIA done within that said you needed to, assuming we didn't exempt? Yeah, with when you have an existing network that's very well connected and you have a number of arterial and collector streets coming and going, it's reasonable to assume that people have a tremendous amount of options for mobility around town and getting around. And it's also tougher to determine those spatial patterns. It's, it's harder for us to determine exactly where they're going to go. So it's, it is fair to say that when you're in an areas that are well connected like that, um, that mitigation is less likely. Mitigation is more likely when you're on the peripherals of town. Things like um, we can use Laurel Hill or uh, Laurel as an example again because 30th is pretty well the primary road in and out of there. So we can assume that people are either going to go to I-5 or they're going to come into town. It's a much more effective tool generally on the peripheral where you have major roads coming in and out. It's, uh, it's a lot harder to apply when you have a gridded network that's well connected. Thanks. Steve? Yeah, I, I was going to also say I, uh, I appreciate John's Christian Joyce's comments about not removing the TA requirement but setting it by, based upon an increase rather than uh, the way it is now. And, and the reason I say that is there's some not so much the core downtown, but this theoretically could happen there. But there's some, there's at least, you know, right now there's one large, very large residential development that could occur on, in the, in the boundary on East 11th. And, uh, and actually, let me back up a minute and say, I have to disagree a little bit with Capstone. We had a whole issue with Alley Vacation and obviously even went to, into, uh, went to the state so there obviously were some concerns there and there's there are some you know there were uh, that's a major bikeway and to vacate an alley there would be a significant problem um, so but I could imagine where you have the same situation here where it's not solely autos but it's also dealing with bicycles from a destination like that I mean again capstone might be a good example we see what how they how the students travel but how they travel from there to to uh, university and to elsewhere could have a significant impact on degrading traffic because now the bicycles are crossing the street and competing or whatever or um, so I'm a little concerned about removing the requirement for a TIA I think I'm fine with it if we do it by Delta because then if if there was a significant use there already and now we're only adding 50 percent, uh, you know, not enough to reach it, then then I, I feel fine. But to remove it altogether because you might end up having some situation occur more on the periphery of the, in the map that um, you would want to deal with in one way or another. I mean, for example, there, uh, you know, there may be some improvements, you may, I don't know, widening or, you know, they'd have to give up something in terms of bicycle access or, or uh, uh, access from their driveway onto the street or whatever that wouldn't necessarily be on their property but um, so that's my concern and I, that's why I, I'm somewhat favorable to Commissioner Jaworski and uh, to Commissioner Lettick's concern about using the difference because if you use the difference then it wouldn't matter it would apply up here and we could still consider using it elsewhere in the city but the same issue would apply here. If you have a big difference being added, um, then you could look at and see what that might mean for the for the emergency vehicles or whatever. Just to help me out on that point, your points about access, bicycle issues, pedestrian issues, as opposed to widening and signalization, those sorts of things. No, it would be the, it would be the same thing. You might widen or signalize something that uh, that you wouldn't, you know, that you, you know. But what we're hearing is that it, it's physically, practically, not possible to do that anymore downtown. Whereas the access issue, the bicycle issues, Christy, correct me on this. Those types of things 
can be addressed through the other code provisions. Through the building permit, mm hmm Well, not exactly. You might have separate bicycle lights, which they do, for example, at 18th and... Uh, yeah, that's not going to get you a bicycle lane. That, that are not on the property, and those wouldn't be included in a... Yeah, that's probably something we should, we should clarify. If somebody, if, if an applicant comes in for a building permit, you're pretty well limited to, to the site itself. Um, code doesn't allow you uh, to go outside of that boundary and go into street uh, street mitigations or street modifications. To do that, you need another tool. And currently, we have we TIA is a tool to get there, but um, one of one of its limitations is it is, it is very car centric. So you had to demonstrate the, not only the impact and you're using it, but you also had to demonstrate that it's reasonably proportional to the impact that the development's proposing for us to go offsite and, and require some of these mitigations. That, are, that or established level of service or performance standards for your transportation network. So a TIA may not be the best tool getting, getting there for offsite pedestrian and bicycle um, impacts, but it doesn't preclude us from developing those tools in the future. Bill? But couldn't the access management tool also require signalization? I'm, I'm thinking if you had, if you have a project that you you have to align a driveway with a street across and have to <laughs> upgrade the signal, that sort of thing, isn't that doesn't that fall into the access management rather than a TIA? That's an that's an excellent question. Uh, unfortunately, access management is just a, a generalized set of um, generalized set of rules for providing access to our street network. One of its limitations is it, it doesn't go into that level of detail. It, believe it or not, it will allow you to put an access in an unsafe spot, but that's where engineering judgment comes in, and generally that's where TIA steps in because they are required to go through engineering analysis, identify sight lines, and if the volumes are high enough, to go through signal, uh, signal warrants to prove that a signal is, is needed there. Access management really just determines the the width, number, and location of, of potential driveways, but it doesn't go above that. Okay. Steve? Just one other question. So there are some, some of the intersections on East 11th are not signalized. Could there be a case where those would want to be signalized depending on a development going on? Are you talking about within the downtown yeah, within area? Yeah, within the area between Broadway and uh, High Street, some of those are not signalized. I think they're all signalized between High and uh, Mill Street. Area. Well, Mill Street's outside. I don't know. Mill Street is in the boundary. Well, it's it's hard to um, on Eleventh. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. So Eleventh stops at High. So it's from High to Lincoln in this boundary. If you can, it might be hard to read the map, but Mill Street is actually one block to the east of the downtown area plan. Okay, so in other words, 11th Avenue itself is not in the boundary from High Street to the university. Right. That is correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I, I misunderstood what the line meant there. So what you're really saying is somewhere in from 11th. Yeah, so we, you know, it's hard to tell at this scale, but we um, then, set the boundary I'm very, you know, um, precisely to you know, exclude 11th east of High and also, for instance, High Street uh, south of 11th is not within that level of service. Okay, well, let me add on to that question. So then right now 11th is not included in the TIA exemption area. A, a portion of 11th. Right, a portion of 11th. What happens if your property is, is, is you build it within the, uh, in other words, if you build it on the, the north side of 11th Avenue in that area, but obviously you could have impact on this area was that a gray area? What, what, what? It, it, um, if you're on the north side, you'd be exempt from a TIA. Okay. If you're on yeah. the south side, you could feasibly trigger one. That doesn't make sense to me. It's, it's a, a interesting, I think, byproduct of trying to draw uh, a line around downtown and, and have a gridded street network within the same boundary mm -hmm. as properties that you are exempting from a TIA. Right. Again, if, if all those streets were signalized already, then it wouldn't be an issue. But if you may, you know, if some point in the future you need to signalize Ferry Street on 11th because of some development that happens there, then we don't have any mechanism now the city has to do. If it's a development on the north side within the TIA exempt area and it feasibly would have triggered that mitigation, you would be correct. Well, let's see where we are, folks. Um, the recommendation 
<coughs> is to expand the TAA exempt boundary to include the downtown plan area with the exception of the properties within the eWeb master plan. That's how it came to us the other day. So a uh, straw vote on this because we'll wrap it all up next week as a bundle, but let's just see where we are. So uh, all in favor of the recommendation, raise your hand. Is this just changing the boundary? This and, and going to LOSF. Yeah. It's all in the package. Not, not changing, going to the recommended boundary by staff, downtown Correct. boundary. Ex right. Expanding the boundary to include downtown plan area, but not the EWIB master plan area. Okay. All in favor of that, raise your hand. Opposed? So That's considering the TIA. Are you, are you didn't mention it in the second time you read that. I mean, yeah. It's expanding the TIA exemption area to include the downtown plan area with the exemption, the exception of the eWeb master plan, dropping it to LOSF, just, just like was proposed originally. Do we need to re-vote? Okay. We've got three to two with two absences. Before we wrap up, it might, um, are there specific questions which we should follow up on when we come back to you next week? Steve? Well, I, I was just going to follow up with, with John. She says, again, I would, I'm fine with, with changing the rules for the TIA so that in this area, if that's the simplest, to make it so that it's the increase that triggers it rather than you know, a certain number of trips. Um, I mean, that would be a way to, so if, if you could explore that as an option, um, that might be a way of getting a stronger vote of support. Well, but the driving factor is dropping it to level of service F. That's what keyed in my mind. If we do that, then the TA requirement, whether or not it's as current or net, doesn't pertain because you can't adjust F any lower than it is. Right. Yeah, but you can still, I mean, you can, <coughs> seems to me you could have rules that it would, uh, in other words, this is level of service F and unless there's a new thing added that would increase the number of parking uh, trips beyond some measure that was used now to trigger, trigger a TIA and then that doesn't apply. That's yes. why I'm asking them to explore that. You asking within that exempt area or citywide for us? Like, to, no, this is within the exempt area. criteria of TIA yeah. where it says 100 trips yeah. for the development? If it was level of service F, though, and you somebody had 100 net trips, there's if the acceptable level of service is F, there is no mitigation that would ever be required. Well, another way of putting it is you could say level of service E, unless the that the, that level of trips was less than 100, and then you would <coughs> consider it acceptable too. In other words, you can do this the reverse. If the planning commission had a concern about lowering the level of service to F, we can alternately look at that change to be a net change, and that is something that other cities around the country do. It's a net change, not just trips. And I believe, um, actually, the net change follows. ITE guidance on how you set up TIAs as well. It's a different. It's a little bit different conversation. For this purpose, we're looking at the downtown area plan. The driving factor that registered with me today is you're really proposing to drop it to F. Dropping it to F makes the TIA issue moot. But I think it's worthwhile exploring the net idea citywide. <coughs> That's something at some point in time ought to separate. And, and, and I'd appreciate if we could find out the times for maybe A through F just to, for reference, just so that we know, have a better perspective of what we're talking about going from E to F, especially. Absolutely. Steve? Well, again, I just want to couch, my concern is 11th and 13th because those are the main transportation routes for the emergency vehicles from the fire station going east and west. And, you know, uh, all of a sudden, when, when, when I was told that you could have a development inside here that could, you know, essentially tr choke traffic on 11th, um, you know. Unless the city puts in a light. John? Yeah, uh, 
I'd like to support what Commissioner Baker has indicated uh, concerning that option. That's why I did not support the motion. And initially, in, in our other meeting when we discussed this, my concern within the downtown was development on the peripheral, which will definitely affect things outside of the downtown area. And not requiring a TA won't offer any help for all those on the peripheral of that area. My actual question, though, was on page five, it, it's getting back to what I said before, that um, <clears throat> in the last paragraph it said the alternative, this option would raise new questions which weren't explored before the public hearing. At some time I'd like to clarify that. I always thought the purpose of the public hearing was to raise questions to what was being presented and maybe even come up with some preferred solutions. What that suggests to me is that if something new comes up or questions are raised, we can't consider it. And I did not think that was the purpose of a public hearing. So That's I not, that, that um, perhaps we didn't word that correctly. Yes, absolutely. Um, if new ideas come up in your deliberation, uh, maybe as a result of something that you heard at a public hearing, those you're absolutely allowed and, and we're happy to, to take those considerations. We were just pointing out that this could have wider implications. It wasn't something that was originally proposed. It's a bit of a, of, of a change of course. Could take more time, more analysis, um, but it's absolutely within your purview to, to consider that if that's your desire. I think if we would have stayed at E, we could have been talking about that within the downtown plan at this time finding a way to do it if we wanted to. Okay. Catherine, Matt, Scott, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, agenda item three, stormwater code amendments action. Peggy, Catherine, you're just going to stay right there. Right While we're making the change, I wanted to take this opportunity to introduce a new attorney that was added to the city attorney's office. Ann Davies is here. We're very. What was her name? Ann Davies. Ann Davies. Thank she you. is a 20 year attorney with lots and lots of land use experience, served a um, few years as a Luba referee, brings with her municipal land use experience, and we are very excited to have her in our office, and you will be seeing her. A Luba referee. <laughs> <laughs> Should we oh just have her come, come to the table now? We can start really working on her. Yeah. Really we, want that her to true? we want her to stay. Don't scare her, please. <laughs> hey, we need to schedule a special meeting, Carol. We have a Luba attorney. <laughs> Boy, we got a lot of questions we can ask her about why things happen the way they do. <laughs> well, welcome aboard. Eh? Yeah, welcome. <laughs> okay. All right, should we talk about stormwater? So th thank you. This is the um, time to take a look at the testimony that was received on the stormwater management <coughs> uh, code amendments that we provided. Any Jane stormwater management is an important and valued service to urban growth and development. And over the years, much of our stormwater management has been focused around flood control and protecting the uh, city from flooding and the impacts to flooding. But since the early 1990s, the city has included stormwater quality and natural resource protection. And this is largely due to federal requirements that have come down. But it's also due to the improving, um, due to improving n the environment and how it improves the quality of urban living. Eugene is a phase one NPDES city and it received its first permit in 1996. At that time, the city was required to develop stormwater standards on managing stormwater, both for flood control and reducing or improving water quality. Those standards were developed in 2006. That first permit also included construction site management standards. Those are what we also call erosion standards. And those standards were developed in 1997 and have been in place since then. But these development standards that we're looking at for post-construction are how to maintain and manage stormwater runoff after the construction's done and the rainwater continues to fall on impervious surfaces. The Standards were developed in 2006. 
we received an update or an issued a new permit in 2010 and that NPDES permit required us to look at mimicking some of our stormwater management to natural hydrologic um, conditions, which means that they wanted more on-site management of stormwater. They wanted to reduce the downstream impacts of runoff, the increased flows and the erosive um, impacts due to longer and higher flows coming from the runoff. So the city sat back and looked at um, the standards. We looked at the NPDES permit, which was provided in your AIS. We also reviewed a lot of the discussions that were held during the development of the permit and understanding what DEQ want us to, wanted us to do and how to implement those standards. Those primarily included doing on-site management, infiltrating stormwater, filtrating it if you couldn't infiltrate it, and then providing some alternative if you couldn't do either of those. And the city set up the hierarchy that requires infiltration first, filtration second, and then we looked at mechanical treatment, continuing that option in stormwater development. Um, or development of properties and how to reduce at least the pollutants if because we felt that Envision Eugene and the policies on development in Eugene were to uh, densify and utilize as much of the urban growth area as possible and allowing development to continue. So we did put in the requirement that if a property had the ability to build out to the ex full extent of its property. So if you had zero lot lines or um, in a commercial area where you have less of the requirement for open spaces, that we would not create a code that might conflict with those abilities and allowed the third option, which was mechanical treatment. We went through the public testimony that received prior to the public hearing and during the public hearing and summarized all of those comments in the AAS that we provided you last week and then gave you our staff responses. We did propose a few changes to the code which we've also provided here and at this time I think that uh, what we'd like to just um, make clear here is that storm management, stormwater management will be provided publicly, public infrastructure will be provided for flood control, but that we are looking at putting a requirement on private development that would require that more on-site treatment be provided for the smaller storm events. The um, stormwater management manual will be updated later this year. It will have its own public process and there will be a time for people to weigh in on those changes. We are also having a separate SDC or stormwater development standard or stormwater systems development charges that are going to be changed to help uh, recognize the benefits of those that are doing the infiltration and filtration, which will be followed up later this year also and that these code amendments are being proposed to further improve the water quality of the stormwater runoff and also reduce the negative impacts of urban runoff. I'd like to begin the discussion. Rick. John, he was quicker. Bill. Bill, Rick, and then John. <laughs> okay. I'll give him a quick draw. Uh, faster on the draw. Um, on, on page 10 of our agenda, um, on response 7, where you mention um, on who judges the mechanical treatment option at the end there. Um, am I to understand where you say that um, compliance with proposed EC 9.69923D does not require a developer to alter their proposed development footprint to accommodate an infiltration or filtration facility, um, that you won't be evaluating that, that 
at that point then they're locked into mechanical. Is that the way I understand that? It wouldn't be locked into or mechanical, but they would be that's approved their only option with the mechanical. Point, okay. But if they came in for the building permit and then they later found that they really wanted to implement some other measures besides the mechanical, we would okay. allow that permit to okay. move forward. And then maybe if I can do a follow-up to that. Um, the cost of mechanical, have you evaluated that in relation to the size of a project, what that might add and how that might affect a project's cost? A small facility is about $8,000. One of the largest facilities, which would be more at the subdivision or level, was about 25000 So you have three ranges, 8000 8 to 10000 then you have about um, fifteen to 20000 and then 25000 for the high end of it. We find that um, most of the ones that you have, if it's a single property, they would be around the 8,000 range. Okay. And then my last question, if I can, is when that stormwater management comes to public hearing, does that come before us or is that city council or? <coughs> no, at this point it doesn't go to uh, the planning commission. It's not a code change. Okay. And, uh, but we are planning on doing it as an ordinance and it will go through the council. That would be council, okay. But our goal is then that following the adoption of that, then it would be amended administratively. So we would continue to do that through um, the department level. And it wouldn't go to council or planning commission after that. Rick? Um, maybe a clarification. So if someone's building a 1,200 square foot house, and it's on a small lot subdivision, they could expect to pay an additional $8,000 for a mechanical system? Most of the residential lots that we've looked at, unless you're looking at an actual townhouse, uh, would not do the mechanical. They would have sufficient land area to provide at least the filtration side of it. And any guess on what that system might cost someone? Again, the reason is, is Envision Eugene talks about housing affordability and mm -hmm. issues like that. We estimated that the construction cost um, was around $40 a square foot and for 1,200 square feet at... Um, Tell me the numbers. 36. Uh, so so uh, it's really minimal. I mean, you're less than $1,000 at that point as you build it into the system, wouldn't you say? Yeah, and for residential, you can use uh, infiltration mm -hmm. Like a like a trench that are cheaper methods. Like the old um, dry well type? Yes. <coughs> yes. Um and I is is the intent I, I kinda I know you have to haven't written the manual yet, but there's a lot of small projects that could you know, if you're adding a thousand square feet to a house, put a second floor on it or whatever it might be. I mean, I know it's impervious areas or patios or decks or driveways or whatever. To go out and have somebody engineer all that runs above the three, four, five, six, eight, ten thousand dollar number, so you just keep adding and adding and adding. Is the city intent to offer examples of how you could do you know, engineered, small engineered projects, so I could take your how-to paper from the city and give it to my small contractor and he could do that kind of stuff? Yes. Okay, and great. And we'll be able to um, size that in-house for them or provide the um, calculator for them to determine how big it is. Okay, I've got others, but I'll wait until we get a little further along. Okay, John? Yeah, I... I will follow a little up on what Commissioner Randolph has said. And basically, I was looking primarily at uh, responses on uh, 2 and 7, uh, redu reduction of the land and who can, uh, you know, cannot the land be, uh, if it cannot be located. But ba basically, what I wanted to say here was when I read that second paragraph and the last line sort of says that the city stormwater development standards do not prevent land that is currently buildable from building being built upon. The first thing that came into my mind, if there's a large site and it's all buildable, then you're saying your two preferred treatment things can't be done because it's all buildable land. And just, just hitting me that way. Then when I read number seven, 
And number seven indicates that also toward the end of the paragraph, that no point during the review process will be staff evaluating whether the proposed footprint of the development can be altered to accommodate these types of facilities. I see these two together because now I have a lot that's still being buildable. And as a developer, I put out a footprint that has no place to do filtration or infiltration. And these policies say that you won't have me do it then. So according to that, you don't achieve your first two hierarchies. Am I misreading this? You're not. I mean, it, it is an attempt. This code, these code amendments are an attempt to balance all of this. It's to balance the prioritization of infiltration, filtration, while balancing that against policies of infill and densification. And so what it says is, is we want to prioritize infiltration and filtration, and we, staff wants to help figure out the smallest possible facilities that will work for a particular development site. But that said, to further goals of densification and infill, if a, if a development site is going to be built out to the point that there isn't room for the smallest facility that could be used, you can still use mechanical. Um, and so because mechanical, it's, you still prioritize the others, but you can use mechanical if that is what is necessary to, um, for, to, for that particular development site. So you are reading it correctly. If we pulled off mechanical, let's say we just, let's say the code just said, you've got two choices, infiltration and filtration, period. For us to sit here and say that there would be zero impact on buildable lands, I don't think we could make that statement. And so leaving the mechanical option for um, development sites, now they don't get the, they're not going to get their SDC benefits because the city has to absorb those um, green infrastructure type <coughs> costs within our system. So we're prioritizing and incentivizing through SDC benefits. Um, so we're hoping that people will make enough room, um, but at the same time, we want develop we want the code to people to be able to maximize their development site before in the same manner before this co these code amendments and after the code amendments are adopted. Okay, just to come, I, I just think the balancing act was pretty much biased the other way, and you're not going to achieve your goal objectives of filtration and infiltration as your highest priority. Just a comment. We're hoping the SDCs help us get there, and it's a tough balancing act. Rick, you had a follow up on it? Well, I, I thought I read somewhere in the response for infiltration and, and filtration that it actually can be done under a hard surface area. Well, I know mechanical can be, but there was a comment in here that made it almost sound like you could put something else under hardscape. Maybe I misread that. I think you misread that. Okay, because it didn't make sense to me that that would work that way. There are some impervious area reduction techniques, so you could use permeable. Right, um, I understand that asphalt. part, yeah. You could also use a green roof on a building, and you would take care of your responsibility for treatment before you even entered the hierarchy, so there are some of those. And there hasn't been much success of green roofs in Oregon with the amount of <laughs> rain that we have. Go ask the county. <laughs> it's moss awesome. all over my roof. <laughs> <laughs> There are also Does some emerging technologies that are coming out. Uh, stormwater technology is really being, um, since this has been applying at the federal level, pretty well to all states and, and, and permits, you know, we're seeing a lot of the companies come up with technology that, that's balancing both. There are some techniques out there that can be used under sidewalks and things uh, that achieve the same stormwater quality uh, management benefits but, uh, it's on an ongoing basis. And um, it's, uh, we'll just have to see how well those are applied on site and, and, and in development. Have you got Steve? Yeah. I will. I would like to take and respond. You did see that um, there are some infiltration that can be done under parking lots, and that was on number seven here, and that would be your dry wells or what we yes, call the, okay. the soakage trenches. We can't get people to do under uh, parking lots. So, um, no, I mean that under subsurface your parking infiltration. Yeah. <laughs> and the water's going to percolate up, <laughs> not down. Yeah, I was going to. And my comments are specifically, well, I'm going to focus on multifamily because my neighborhood, we have a lot of experience with these. Um, and in general, in residential, I don't think they're really, in multifamily residential, um, the bulk of the projects in my neighborhood have used... Um, Mechanical. No. Oh. Mechanical. 
Well, some of them used mechanical. The bulk of them have used the, 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 the above ground. Okay, infiltration. Rain gardens. What, yeah, ray, yeah okay. above ground filtration, where they okay. basically pipe it to those. There are, there are a few that used mechanical, but they're the exceptions in my neighborhood. And, and now the, the reason I mention this is in multifamily, you have a requirement for open space. So you already have some requirement for open space. So it ends up eating up some open space or fries it in a different way. There's a, you know, a bench with some stuff in it, growing in it. Uh, you know, but uh, that's how, uh, uh, for example, Gordon Ansel handled it on some smaller projects over by, uh, well, on Mill Street and a number of the other larger projects did the same way they put bigger bins. So the problem, the, the problem I see is for multifamily, you can use, you know, and, and a developer for other reasons, you know, they may put an underground parking and they may decide that because of the layout they end up wanting to do mechanical be just because to maximize whatever they were going to do. Uh, an example would be if you did a courtyard building and everything is sort of inside, right, there's no place for the, the and there are some examples of that. Where I see that, that you have a problem with space is in, if you built a residential building, because densification we're primarily talking about, I mean, we're talking about other developments, but right now in terms of what's actually happening on the ground, we're mostly talking about housing. So where you have a problem is if when you build the same project in a commercial zone or a geo, geo zone, then the open space requirements are not required, and then you don't have you don't automatically have the space to provide that unless you do it, you know, as part of your design. So what I'm pointing out is that um, for multifamily, I'm not talking about one or two, two family dwellings. I'm talking about multifamily where you have, you know, a few units to uh, 50 units or whatever. Um, there's generally, because of the open space requirements, you can generally handle it with exfiltration. Is that what you call the tanks mm -hmm. above? Because I get confused with infiltrate, yeah. So, um, you know, that seems to be uh, the experience in my neighborhood in terms of the projects. Uh, and again, like I say, the problem I could see is when you build housing in commercial zones and you don't have open space requirements, then you don't have this area that you, you know, you have to provide that area yourself if you were gonna do it. Uh, in terms of, and that would be the place where there would definitely be, unless you compromised and provided open space so you could have this space for that, you would end up having to, essentially having to use mechanical. Got myself in the queue before I swing back around to Bill and Rick. Peggy, uh, my, ha my question, first one has to do with the existing exemption. I was listening to you and trying to connect that to item 13 on, I guess it's PC agenda page 11. Uh, it says that the existing exemption for the residential uh, one and two family dwellings was provided in the 2006 code. Is it still there or did something happen in 2010? No, it is in the existing code, yes. The two, we when we talk about the 2010, that's when we were issued this new NPDES right. permit. When we were when we adopted the code in 2006, we were under our old permit. Okay, so what exactly is exempt then? At the current time, we allow residential one and two family dwellings on existing lots an exemption to the stormwater post-construction standards. So they don't have to do any pollution reduction. So if something is subdivided today, you can build a house on it and not worry about this? A subdivision would not be classified as a one or two family dwelling permit. So the subdivision level coming in today would look at the whole subdivision and how they would take the runoff from the lots that they're creating and do the pollution reduction, which they could either do as a subdivision level or they could do it on the individual lots. But now that's that's what you're proposing, or that's according to even what exists now? With that's the existing code. Okay. The new proposal would say that anybody coming in for a one or two family dwelling, whether it's an existing lot or a lot that's being created in a new development, 
when they come in for the creation of the impervious surface, if it's over a thousand square feet, then they would have to um, provide the um, meet the hierarchy requirements on site. Could they do infiltration? Could they do filtration? And then if they, you know, like townhouses can get lot to lot. Okay, so just a regular old single family home on a regular old 4,500 to 10,000 square foot lot, are you anticipating that most of those will require one of these $8,000 mechanical units? No, we think they'll do filtration. I think that, um, We'll have a few that will want to take advantage of the filter infiltration because they can do some other benefits with that, not just um, meet the standard. But um, most lots coming in have curbs, so they will do filtration, and then we pull to the curb. Planter boxes um, uh, is the probably the primary thing that we will see, and it means that the downspout will go to a small box facility. It will be it'll have plants in it that'll take up some of the pollutants, and it has the soil that the water filtrates through. Then the water is collected and it takes out to the curb. Uh, that's what we typically see. They're very small. Most houses um, are less than 50 square feet on this facility, and you can take it from each corner of the house. I mean, you can be very creative with it and build it into your landscaping. But what about Rick mentioned, like the old dry wells? And, and we still have a, a number of people that do that. Mm -hmm. And that's so that where they get the added benefit to that is with the dry well, is they can eliminate their stormwater fees completely because they're keeping all their stormwater on site. I wonder, is, is that for replacement dwellings also? Sure. No, I mean... It's an option. So if I take down a house uh, and build a new house, these come into play? If it's a fire, I mean, if you have to just take something... It's just no, I mean, if we, if we actually want infill to occur, we would expect older, less quality, smaller value homes to slowly, some of those to be replaced over time. <coughs> then those would be required to include treatment. Okay. And how do you make, the, excuse me if I'm jumping the gun. Well, well it's okay. Yeah. Go, ahead. Well, Go ahead. How do you, <laughs> I, I kind of chuckle now because I see people quote remodel homes that they leave one wall and we call it a remodel or a remodel a building. Would that be considered remodeling if I leave part of the foundation so that I don't have to do it? I mean, what's the, what's the trigger point? It's, it's new or replaced impervious surface. So they have, if they have a thousand square feet or more of new or replaced impervious surface. So if they leave one wall, but they're still replacing Okay, great. Sorry, Bill. It's okay. No problem. Um, you were talking earlier about SDC credits for infiltration and filtration and that you anticipated, especially on single-family dwellings, that most of these systems would be in the hundreds of dollars to build rather than thousands of dollars. Are you looking at or are you considering, or maybe I'm suggesting you should look at and consider, when you're looking at the SDC credits, that the SDC credit would be roughly comparable to what the added cost is for such a facility. So for instance, a single family dwelling that might require a filtration system that maybe costs 800 to 1,000 dollars, is it possible or conceivable to have the SDC credit roughly comparable to that so that that helps with housing affordability and uh, those sorts of things in single family. I guess that's maybe a suggestion I'd throw out there as, as a way to help mitigate some of that additional cost. I will put that in the notes. Um, okay. SDC charges for stormwater aren't typically... Um, not typically that high. Uh, it'll be difficult to, okay. to do that, but we'll definitely take a look at that as we develop them. Okay. John? Yeah, uh, it, it's amazing, uh, Commissioner Randa. Um, uh, I'm also, I have a question on number 10, which also deals with SDCs and credits. Uh, <laughs> this is not rehearsed. But, in, but anyway, sure, uh, in, in, the, in the second paragraph there, it indicates that if you can't do infiltration or natural filtration, LID, that you uh, are therefore, through your SDCs, you pay for a share of the lid capacity of city capital projects. Okay. 
Now, the issue, what I see there is, is when a devel development is paying the SDC fees, do you then go in and calculate what that fee is? Is there already a percentage? Or do you say, oh, if they're not doing infiltration, it's more? That's the first, that's the first part of my question. Uh, I mean, right now, and I, the SDC methodology is based on square mm -hmm. footage. Yeah. Um, and so right now, and then we've got also then you have your stormwater fees, and which can also be reduced through certain things as well. So there's actually two components. The, the ability to reduce your monthly stormwater fees is already existing in the program if you can prove certain things that you're not releasing certain things. So that already exists. The way and I don't know what the intent is for changing it, but right now there is one stormwater SDC fee based on square footage depending on the type of development that you're doing. So the way, the way I'm framing my question is, is let's suppose they're building a certain square footage and the SDC fee for stormwater is $1,000. Okay. Okay. But they're not going to do anything on site. So does that then say now it's going to be 2000 because we're going to have to do the capacity? The, the, my understanding of what the general intent is, is it's not a punishment, it's an incentive. No, I understand that. So we, were not in, so we would not be, so take your example, if right now the, the, the <coughs> thousand square, or the, the, the square footage would result in a thousand dollar SDC. Uh, my understanding, and Mark can jump in here too, is it would not, we wouldn't say, now you're doing mechanical, so now it's 2,000. It's, you're doing mechanical, so it's 1,000. If you were doing infiltration or filtration, it's 500. So it's not that, based on my understanding of the discussions, it's not that we're going to increase the cost because of mechanical. We're going to decrease the cost if they're using infiltration or filtration. So you're giving them a credit for an amount for what they're doing. That's right. Okay. Just to get back. Can I, I, I think, go ahead. And I, and I don't know if this will help, but um, for me, and and again, Mark, you're, you're welcome to <laughs> join us. But when we develop our uh, storm developers, system development charges, they look at the cost of providing the capacity to the system. And then it gets to be a fee for the developer that comes in. So if you're residential, and I'm just going to make up the numbers, um, you're coming in for a house and to provide the SDCs for that capacity on that would be maybe a thousand dollars. Now the new changes are in our stormwater system is not just the um, capacity of the flood control but also to provide pollution reduction. Okay, so it cost us another incremental cost for the city to provide pollution reduction in our system that's then added to the SDC. So the SDC charge may then go from 1000 to 1200 But if you provide that service on site yourself, then you get a reduction in your SDC because you provide it on site, where a mechanical doesn't provide the same benefits. So, so they would pay the full fee. So part of this is, is, a, is I don't know if you're amending, but adding criteria for eligibility for credits under the SDC system. So somewhere, what we're talking about will end up that this is now a credit. Okay, another reason that I brought that up, as we talked earlier, TIAs are a way of getting into transportation impacts and adding credits for SDC fees. Otherwise, it has to be in a pre-approved plan. So I just mentioned that in passing. <coughs> uh, Peggy, um, jumping to a bigger kind of picture here, uh, I asked uh, for stormwater basin plans, and that website to stormwater didn't get me there, but I, I found them in a different way oh. to get there. Would you send that out? Yeah. Uh, but on page, PC agenda item page 13, uh, towards the end of number 15, which starts <coughs> on the previous page, it talks about vacant areas and their respective planned zoning designations were analyzed to project the increased built-out impervious surface area for identifying future conveyance capacity with the drainage basins. Envision Eugene, uh, buildable lands inventory, 
is this being coordinated with that in such a way that we're not somehow restricting, unknowingly restricting, I guess, how would we know that? I'm hoping that this analysis that apparently was conducted, how, whatever constraints that might put on buildable land capacity, is that being shared with the folks that are taking a look at the buildable lands inventory right now? Um, and I can tell you, and Carolyn, jump in, please, also, that we're, there's even, even a further drill down happening right now to look, because of some of the questions raised at the public hearing, um, Heather O'Donnell is working with Therese Walsh um, specifically at stormwater capacity, so stormwater facility capacity. So when that discussion is coming back to you within the Envision Eugene con um, conversation about capacity and about needs, that the we there is a specific understanding and those things are connected up between our current stormwater facilities or whether we need to look at our PFSP to address needed facilities. Okay. So that conversation is happening. Those that it, that and it is happening together as part, and that discussion will come back to you as part of Envision UG. Okay. So if if these code amendments are adopted, though, does that how does that connect then with the Envision Eugene Global Lands Inventory? It doesn't. It doesn't. Um, that conversation, while um, it was it was. It really, that question about capacity within our stormwater, these code amendments don't impact it at all. Um, it really is, it really is a better conversation as a part of Envision Eugene. It was good that we got the heads up so we could make sure that, that we had the information and could prepare for that discussion. But for purposes of these code amendments, z zero. Um, Oh, do I have something Oops. to add, Heather? I just wanted to add something. If, if it's well, helpful. sure, you showed up at the meeting. You might yeah, as well I say something. <laughs> um, so agreed with what Catherine said. The other thing I want to remind you of is, um, so for instance, you were talking about the 2006 stormwater code amendments and when those went into effect. And Envision Eugene, when we're looking at what density assumptions to assume on vacant and partially vacant land, we look back at um, what density has occurred for for instance, for ECLA, for the Eugene Comprehensive Lands Assessment, we looked at 2001 through 2008. So it would have incorporated some development that happened um, s between 2006 when the stormwater code amendments and the effect that those had on development between 2006, 2008. We're updating those density assumptions and bringing them up to date through um, 2012. So we'll have more development that's occurred under the 2006 stormwater standards. So you can imagine when we check in on monitoring again on whether or not our density assumptions are happening the way we assumed they were because we were projecting using historic densities. Um, so in five years we check in those will incorporate the densities we're seeing under the new stormwater standards. So while they're not singled out separately as a separate line item, it's intuitively in the density assumptions because any development that happens from whenever these are adopted would have happened. Um, so if there was a reduction in density, that would be seen, it would be reflected in our monitoring. And, and, the, and the, the reason why we can say that that conversation works more productively a part of Envision Eugene is because the way this is structured, the, um, the, the amount of density that could be allowed under the current 2006 code could also happen under this code. Okay. Okay. No building constraint. Okay. Gotcha. Rick? Um, back to... Well, let me ask, kind of a make sure I've got the definition right. I understand the hierarchy of infrastructure, or, um, infiltration, filtration, and mechanical. Is the hope that some of the filtration process will also filter and, and allow water to percolate into the ground? Is that the plan? So that's why the argument is that the mechanical system, because the idea of the mechanical system is to remove all particulates and pollutants if they're working correctly and 
that's another story. Um, <laughs> smoke and mirrors. Um, because I, I, I hope that you look, when you take a look at the exemption, I'm a little concerned, one, as I mentioned, I think, the last time, that if you truly can't fit one of these other types in, then you're, in my mind, penalizing somebody for having to use a mechanical system where they may not have another choice. Um, so I would ask that you consider that when you write the manual. If there is no other choice for whatever the reasons might be that you consider that. But I also then would go back to the Envision Eugene pillars and suggest you take a good hard look upon how much land area is actually used by filtration and infiltration and, and what may be lost to building capacity if somebody decides to use that because you give them so many credits that they aren't going to use the mechanical. That's interesting. Because one of our goals, particularly on our corridors, is for high dense projects and high dense projects mean you use more land area. Now again, multiple um, multifamily requirements have open space and other things like that, but please look to balance those to make sure that that's calculated because I have a little trouble that you exempt somebody who may want to want to build a higher project, but they say, well, I'm not going to build as many units because I get better credits. Now, again, it may not be enough money that it matters, but I ask that you look for that. Um, I assume that some sort of joint system would be allowed in the code, meaning mm -hmm. you could use infiltration and mechanical if you had to. Um, the other thing I didn't notice in, and maybe I missed it, but I don't see clear definitions of what infiltration, filtration, and mechanical is in the code. Um, and, and as Scott recently said, this technology, and I believe it's probably going to be sort of the next solar power technology, that it's going to change so quickly that without good definitions, you could get something that shows up that may look mechanical but actually do infiltration better than maybe what we think. And so I'd hate to see us fall behind the curve because we have three categories that doesn't understand where new technology should fit. So I would ask that some good broad definitions be put into the code so that as these things come out faster and faster that we're not back saying, well, that, we don't know where that fits, so we're going to put it in the worst one, which means we don't get the benefits we might get out of these systems. And, and I, my understanding is, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is to actually capture that in the manual, which is a more flexible document. Um, Wherever it is. Updated, absolutely. Because my first question when we started working on this is, are there going to be this kind of laundry list of you want to do infiltration, here is your list and uh, the manner and what they look like and all that. And filtration, <coughs> same thing. And as, as it is a changing world, then that manual can be updated to it. Well, unfortunately, we all talked about that with land use type issues and our lists never keep up. They're sometimes years if not decades behind of what we're out there so mm -hmm. I'd hate to have to have the manual updated to put new technology in I think it'd be easier to describe it in such a way that new technology finds a home to sit as it comes in well and there is a there is a um, an adjustment review piece in here that says you got something bigger better brighter um, and it got John's attention. <laughs> Every adjustment has a, an appeal process attached. I know, I know. And so it's not a perfect world, but we did want to at least give that, do you have Do you have something out there that isn't captured in the manual or isn't captured, you know, because we certainly don't want to inhibit, you know, expanding minds and technology. So that that is in there. Adjustment is in there. Before a filtration facility, yeah, they do infiltrate. That's accounted for in the manual. You know, just because we have poor soils doesn't mean that they can't infiltrate a little bit. So we're discouraging the use of liners and things like that. So, um, so for a filtration facility, people can account for the fact that there is infiltration on site. It just doesn't happen to be all that all that high. You just have to use a piping system to overflow to be able to accommodate that and prevent flooding. Uh, hybrid facilities will be allowed. Also, people can use these things in, in chains or in series. Uh, you can use um, certain filtration facilities in conjunction with the on-site infiltration, things like dry wells, soakage trenches. Uh, those those are currently allowed also. And also on the on the mechanical side too, that's an excellent excellent thing you brought up. Um, currently, uh, most people in the Northwest uh, defer to the Washington Department of Ecology. They have an excellent program up there, 
where basically any, any stormwater manufacturer that really wants to be recognized for pollutant reduction goes through their program. So they have a continu <coughs> continually updating list, and we reference that often for um, equivalent mechanical filtration. So there are certain facilities, uh, for example, they make a, a structural facility now that actually houses um, the roots of a tree and passes water through it. Technically, it's a mechanical facility. You know, it's, it's structural, but it's equivalent to some of the greener technologies that we have due to the soil and the, and, and the tree. So all those are accounted for in the manuals, and those are um, techniques that people can use to reach equivalency for some of those technologies. That was one of the things we, uh, we wanted to do. Things will become more dense, and we want to provide more flexibility to, to take into account the fact that, you know, take the site context into evaluation. Just to be sure, you know, that you understand that utilizing the manual to define what is infiltration, what is filtration, um, gives us more flexibility in um, expanding as technology changes than to have to come back to the code and change it any time <coughs> that um, we see something that might work better or not work so well. So. Bill? I think in our last meeting I was asking if we had a definition for green infrastructure. I think that came up and I I actually saw that back in the document that we do have that definition, but yet under your summary ordinance modifications you went ahead and removed uh, low impact development and green infrastructure from uh, 9.6792. I mean, do we really need to do that where we do have that definition or do you think that just makes that a little clearer to read? And then I have one quick follow-up wordsmith item. We actually took that out so that it was, um, and that de how we put that back in was the wording that came out of the NPDES permit. Okay. So instead of just putting a label in there, we took the words that they defined in the permit and put it in the code. Okay. And then my last one in the actual ordinance on page 12 um, under uh, 9.8320 PUDs, section 15 um, in the red section that you've changed there it says and subsection 13 of that section is provide as follows and so I think there's just a typo that's my fault there and maybe I should be maybe is either. deleted is as follows it's, or it's, some it's per, it should have is, a D provided as follows okay and I and I'm missing a little closed paren too I okay think. That's my only wordsmithing I'll do. Thank you. Steve? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, there's been a bunch of questions about how much area, and I was going to mention I, I, uh, a couple of projects you might want to take a look at in West University, uh, <coughs> right across from the Presbyterian Church, so it would be on 15th Avenue, uh, maybe the 500 block. There's a fairly large uh, multifamily project uh, across from the church that uses filtration. Uh, and an example of infiltration would be the West University Park that has a certain amount of impervious area. It has some rain gardens, so it does its drainage by infiltration, two, uh, two small rain, you know, two oval rain gardens. So you might use that. Those are things that were permitted, and if they meet the code requirements, those would be good examples of, uh, and I'll give you a third project, which is a Gordon Anzalo project on uh, Mill Street. It would be like uh, 1480 or something like that, uh, <coughs> the sixplex. But he, he also used filtration out in front, and you could probably contact them. They could tell you how much how much it costs, and you could, you know aside from the areas and the other ones as well they could probably tell you what give you an estimate of what it actually costs to do that um, at least for multifamily I'm talking about so you have a small multifamily a larger one and then you have a filtration infiltration where you basically put it <coughs> back in the ground and and um, as, as I recall all of those were 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 unlined as I, I could be wrong but I think they were all unlined so they were designed to filter into the ground. Rick? Uh, two just small items on the way the code's written. First one on page, uh, well, it's 9.6791. Right. Uh, I'm sorry, it's, um, it's agenda item page 18 under section 4. 
I've read this, uh, I've read one and two under stormwater flood control a couple of times. And it, the way it reads to me is it says that flood control regulations and stormwater runoff apply to all permit applications and land use applications. But we have land use applications that have nothing to do with any kind of structure, impervious surface, or whatever. So, it, and that's the way that's current. That's currently required now. Um, is it applies right now? Flood control applies to all land use and all um, development permit applications, um, and that's a function of our other permits that we have out there and you can speak specifically to those but that isn't a change we're it's, trying to it's it's bold it, and the changes i the, the changes to the language but if it, it says it's for it applies to all development right now part of the problem is, is our stormwater what used to be called storm it currently is called stormwater destination was a carryover from old nine um old chapter nine so um we're we're trying to update that to just be more consistent with the rest and the language we would use. But the actual applicability for flood control is applying with these proposed revisions, it's, it's going to actually apply to less because we're spelling out when it doesn't apply to new development, which is they've got the, um, the flood control facilities are managed by certain um, man-made drainage. Right now, the way the code is, it applies to all development, land use, whatever. Well, well I understand, but mine, mine was more as I come in for a zone change. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm doing is a zone change. That's a land use application. Mm -hmm. How does this apply? Okay. Or, or is it described somewhere else that I just didn't catch the connection? Right. Actually, that's a very good example because zone changes um, really can make an impact on the stormwater system because when we did all of our basin studies, that was based on the proposed um, zone change uh, or zone at the time or as it came into the city. So we knew that if you were in the urban area and you were going to come in as residential, that was already developed. And we created our basin plans based on that information. But if you come in for a zone change to increase that density, then you could have an impact on your stormwater in the flood control. So what we'd be asking them to do is look at it at the time of the zone change. How is increasing um, going to impact the stormwater system that's in place so that we can allow you to upgrade the zone or, or um, do you know what I mean? Right. Kind of okay. Like, I, I understand. Turn it around the other. Okay. I, I understand them. it then. Okay. So that's that's it was just why confusing that is there. the way it was kind of written when I first yeah. looked at it. And the and I yeah and the with keeping the sh the strike out and adding it, it I it, it <coughs> okay. reads confusingly in the bold strike out. I agree. Okay. Then my my next one is under I'm on page 22 and it's under stormwater operations and maintenance 9.6797. Uh -huh. Number one is not crossed out, but everything else is. And the only thing remains when you flip the page is all stormwater facilities shall be operated and maintained in accordance with blah, blah, blah. Is the intent to just lose the purpose? <laughs> no. And, and, and that becomes the only thing there, and it's, I mean, it's number one? So number one is... Um, right. All stormwater facilities shall be operating and maintained in accordance. And then you have the number two is being added. Right. Um, but when we, we looked at operation and maintenance, and it will be robustly dealt with in the manual, it just was never a good fit in the code because, like you said, when you've got code review coming in and it's at the land division stage, is it a, the best, it, when someone's coming in for a partition to draw lines on paper, is that, that, should we be looking at operation and maintenance of a stormwater facility? So it's, it's not that we're all of a sudden not going to have operation and maintenance, but it's best dealt with in the manual. Um, okay, so <laughs> the, the way it actually is struck out here, one is left by itself until you flip the page, it's that just was a, purpose. Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. Absolutely. It so, looked like something got lost. No, and that's just a function of strikeout. The, um, so that all stormwater facilities, that is the new one. Okay. And then you've got two, and everything else is gutted out. Okay. Yeah. And I think that um, I, I don't mean to money the water, but one of the things that. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, stop talking. Wait a minute. Did, did you just say there? that? We're trying to clean the water. <laughs> But um, when we had our 2006... Remember, you're on TV. You just said that. <laughs> no. In 2006, one of the things that was an option was the um, subdivision level of pollution reduction. And at the subdivision level, um, the water or the facility could be managed by the city. Now, with the new standards that are in place, when it's on site... The city's not going to be um, doing any of the maintenance option for on-site systems. And so the code really allowed us to cut away a lot of that, well, if you're going to do it this way and you want it to be privately maintained um, but or privately owned but publicly maintained and if it's going to be publicly built and all that other stuff. So now we're right down to the um, simple fact that if you – build something on your property, you're going to maintain it. And the responsibility of that ongoing maintenance of it is really in Chapter 6, the enforcement side of it. it, it so in the code itself, when you come in for a land use um, application, you're just going to tell us what kind of facility it is. And um, we're assuming that it's on private property and it's going to be privately maintained. And so we're not going to go through... So large systems that are built for a subdivision will become the responsibility of the HOA, the Homeowners Association? If it's, yes. So the city won't be purchasing them and taking care of them like no. they did in the past? No. But we will be maintaining anything in the public right-of-way that's part of the public system. And so it really allowed us to simplify the maintenance um, code language here. So. John? I actually didn't have a question. I have a comment. And, you know, listening to what's going on and, and, and looking at the hierarchy of, of, of goals here of infiltration, filtration for stormwater, a lot of it has seemed to be centered on, uh, as we just talked, buildable lands, density, and the impacts on that. And, uh, and expressed also by Catherine earlier, the purpose of a lot of things is to try to balance different policies and goals that different objectives have relative to all of this being interrelated. With that, just a comment that if we really want to improve the densities within the city, then maybe we should establish minimum densities within zones and minimum building heights and provide incentives either through SDC credits or other incentives to have that happen. Just a comment. We do have minimum densities. Higher. Well, we have Some zones. Building height. Well, we, uh, we have maximums. Well, I think that's a big we have one. minimum density. You know, if you can have something that says on this property it can be 100 feet tall, if someone decides to build three feet because they don't want to put it in an elevator, you're not achieving the kinds of densities that that land was supposed to achieve. Well, I, but I think get, um, having one or the other, so because we do have minimum densities, that we don't want to prescribe exactly what the development looks like. So I think we... Well, maybe you should, because not prescribing what it looks like can sometimes impact adjacent zones, which I'll uh, we'll talk about later. Next week. Two, two questions. Uh, the issue, of, or the whole thing about a lot's going into the manual. That's administrative changes. Are those administrative changes subject to any kind of public review? Yes. Yes. At the council level. No. Um, go ahead. Well, and, and right now, I mean, I, right now, what the code says, the current code, and that isn't being changed, is that the manual is to be adopted through the administrative 2.019 administrative rulemaking process. Um, we follow the. We give DLCD notice, and we have a public hearing because it's a. We've always characterized it as a it's a land use decision um, that we follow um, the decision making process. But what I think I heard Peggy say is, in this case, we're actually going to ask council to adopt the manual the first go around. 
um, and then allow it to be administratively amended, which is similar to your um, design standards and um, the street design standards guidelines that was adopted by resolution of the council with the delegation to um, amend it administratively. So what I think I heard um, Peggy say was that's what we're actually going to propose to do. But there would still be a public review of any proposed amendments? Absolutely. Absolutely. By the director, planning director, the city public manager. work, or oh, city manager. Well, as and as a representative in the manual, the public works actually holds the, yeah. the hearing over it. Um, okay. And we and we did that when we um, adopted the manual originally. There was a public okay. hearing. Okay. I just want to be clear as public review. I've got one more, but Rick, you got to follow up. On well, this? well, just uh, you characterize this as a land use process. Why doesn't it come before the planning commission? given that the Planning Commission tends to be able to spend more time reviewing these documents because we basically only deal with land use where the City Council deals with everything, wouldn't it be better to be presented to us because we can take a much more in-depth look or I would suggest we might be able to do that? Well, and, and I can leave that to Peggy. When it, the, the manual before has was never going to Council either. so. If the manual is going to go to council this time, whether um, it comes through the planning commission, I, it, I don't know if there was a decision already made there. Um, but when it was just at the city manager, um, the, we held a public hearing for purposes of making sure we got the public input. But the, the manual and the first update to the manual didn't go through um, because of the way it was delegated in the code. It was a, basically an administrative rule. Um, where we also have a public hearing. But, uh, and, and resolutions um, don't tend to go through the Planning Commission. Now, if, if it is the Planning Commission's desire to um, review the manual and such before we go up to the Council, I have no objections to that. Um, it's really it, big. <laughs> Big and technical. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, I mean, yeah. These guys don't have anything better to do. <laughs> I'm looking to the chair actually. to see what he thinks, or at least the chair, the, who I believe it, might it be the chair. Be wonderful. <laughs> so, guys to do. I might, you know, maybe, we'll set up a maybe, subcommittee of Maybe we can yeah. talk about it at the yeah. time yeah. And, and, Great idea. and have it as a FYI yeah. Oh, give I, a work, yeah, give a work session and let you know what's going on. I mean, really, let us. I think that would be wise. A couple of yeah. final questions for me. On the findings on PC Agenda page 35, the goal 11 finding, one uh, typo that Bill missed. Uh, <laughs> but then it leads to a bigger question. R right kind of in the middle there, it says these amendments, it should be, are consistent with oh. the adopted. There's your D, Catherine. <laughs> they got I away knew from I you. Left it somewhere. But then, since they are consistent, I'm wondering, and, and since this is a public facilities and services goal, I'm kind of curious why you say that goal 11 does not apply. If, in fact, these are these code amendments are consistent with the PFSP, wouldn't it be safer to have a finding that says they are consistent with goal 11? Instead of saying they don't apply. Yeah. I'm, I think you come to that conclusion under Goal 10, Housing, therefore the amendments are consistent with Goal 10. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't have a problem with that. The, the it, it's all in, the, all in the effort of luba-proofing these things. Maybe we could have somebody and, help us with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll never have luba problems again. I like this. Just strike the last sentence is what you're saying. Well, I, no, you, there, you always, these always conclude with, therefore, these amendments are right. consistent with goal 11 rather than mm -hmm. does not apply. Mm -hmm. And my last point, uh, Peggy doesn't seem to have an objection to review this in three to five years, so I'm going to propose that when Bill makes the motion that we include a review in four years. Okay. Any other points here before we have the motion? Bill's ready to move. Okay, yeah, you want to go ahead and do that? I think, I think I got I move the piece. Planning Commission recommend the City Council approval of the ordinance amending Chapter 9 of the Eugene Code with a subsequent review uh, in four years. John, second. Any further discussion? 
All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Okay, you got unanimous approval with two absent. Okay. okay. Thank you. Well, thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Agenda item four, items from commission and staff. Carolyn? Uh, just a FYI that um, there is a public hearing tonight before the city council on eWeb. So you process that along and um, it's at the council's step now. And so um, just for your interest. And also on Wednesday, we're going to the city council with an update on the South Willamette concept plan. Um, we already talked about in our, our through email that we do um, a new uh, planning commissioner has been appointed, John Borofsky, and often here, but not here today. Um, but we have a meeting on July 1. I will expect him then. Any results of the poll of, of the uh, South Willamette street configuration? No. Okay. I believe there's still. Yeah, They're still surveying. Yeah, 250 responses. Yes. Right. Uh-huh. Okay, that'll be interesting. So uh, items from the commission. Rick? A, a follow-up on, on South Willamette on street design. Uh, that's coming to us, at least that was suggested. Yes, I believe that's true. I, are we going to get a little... Um, some sort of class ahead of time on how we decide what best street designs are versus here's a bunch of ideas and here's our recommendation and then we hear everything else. I, I don't know that I'm a street engineer well enough to be able to make those decisions based on a public hearing process. Um, I will look into that and uh, speak to the project manager. My understanding is all the alternatives that are being put out have been looked at from an engineering perspective and can work. So in other words, they didn't put any out that that we would expect would vetted. fail. So we wouldn't be looking, I, I don't think, to you for a technical kind of uh, recommendation. It's more about um, kind of what are the implications of uh, having uh, different types of transportation using the street versus having it be more auto-centric the way it currently is. And that almost sounded like a commentary. But we dealt, we're dealing with South Willamette from a land use outside the right-of-way, and we're now going to deal with it inside. Will we be given some type of input on how they all sort of work together? Yes. Okay. Definitely. Great. I look forward. <laughs> I will talk to the project manager and start working out a plan to make sure you're up to speed before we ask you to make any decisions. Up to speed, that's a good... Yeah. Sort of like not muddy in the water. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Carolyn, We're uh, starting to get some July 1st, the meeting July 1st. I know John had a family emergency, but he was going to talk about possible candidates for chair and vice chair. Have any of you been contacted? Did he, is he able to... Not officially, no. Okay. No. I, Still, probably ought to put on time on the July 1st agenda the we'll election do. of chair and vice chair. Okay. Uh, then we have a meeting next week, next Monday. We'll finish downtown code amendments, the few remaining that we need to discuss, and then dive mm -hmm. into the two bin items. Steve, how are you coming with yours? John? I'm send it in this afternoon. Perfect. Okay. All right. Very good. And I'm, I'm gathering that. Having those two items will probably be the extent of what we get through, given that we've got downtown code amendments to go with it. Yeah. What do you think? A half hour for downtown code amendments, and then maybe about 45 minutes each for the bin items? Because I, right. I promised John that there would be some time discussion for the transparency issue that he brought up some time ago. Okay. About what to do with the outstanding bin amendments. Right. Where do they live? a website or whatever. Mm -hmm. So we need to work that into. I, we we will definitely strive to finish up the code amendments within half an hour. So, anything else, Steve? I may not be able to be here for the July one meeting. Okay. Was you are for the quorum on that date? So. Okay. I mean, I I may come back. I'm, I'm theoretically on vacation. Leave July one. It was there's no action needed. It's 
just updates. Yeah, just a review so I could send in my comments. Yep. Anything else? This meeting's adjourned. Rick, I just want to